Hello everybody, welcome to Just24 and welcome to another instalment of Game of the Day. This time from round five of Norway Chess. Um, round five was without doubt uh, one of the strangest rounds of the tournament so far. Just a, a round full of heartbreak more than anything, um, especially when we look at uh, the game of, for example, John Ludwig Hammer, who played a fighting game against Veselin Topalov. Very complicated game where both sides had their chances, but John Ludwig hung in there only to blow it all with an absolutely out-of-this-world mistake that uh, you can only uh, attribute to hallucinations or tiredness. Um, also, the likes of Fabiano Caruana, um, another mistake on move 39 cost him a point. Um, and uh, there were some others, but the game of the day that I'd like to choose was a very important day for Magnus Carlsen, who after starting with only half out of four, um, his worst start to a tournament since 2005, I believe. Well, he had wide against Alexander Grischuk and he needed to bounce back immediately. Well, the big question was, an out-of-form Carlsen, could he do this against Grischuk? Let's see what happened. Um, knight f3 by Carlsen, c5 and e4. It's curious, we've seen this uh, move order um, a, f a fair few times this tournament. The point is, the argument is that people don't start with e4 because they're worried about e5. So um, they play knight f3 first to stop e5 make them play c5 or another system, and then transpose into a Sicilian. Uh, d6 by Grishchuk, and here Magnus already plays a slightly un, uh, interesting or um, unexpected move. Uh, and it's very strange to say that, well, 3d4, the open Sicilian, how can this be an unexpected move? Well, Magnus has traditionally played bishop b5 check. Um, and tried to get a small advantage out of these lines, but clearly he didn't fancy that against Grishchuk. Maybe Grishchuk had uh, prepared that. Um, so he went for a main line. Uh, we got a Nydorf, and Carlsen plays g3. He's never going to go into an absolutely uh, theoretically heavy line, such as uh, a move like bishop g5, uh, which can lead to a poison pawn, and you need to know the theory. There's just no other way or perhaps even a line like bishop e3, which again is uh, something that Alexander Grishchuk is very well versed in. So the move g3 doesn't surprise me at all. g3 and the move h3, they, um, they can have a lot of things, a lot of different um, ideas in common. Uh, g3 is a bit more of an older main line. Most people play h3 now. Um, the idea being that with h3 that sometimes you can actually play g4 in one go. But g3 is of course absolutely fine. I think Mickey Adams still plays this system from time to time. And after g3, e5, that's a very typical response to kick the knight away. Knight d2 and now bishop e7. Again, this has all been seen many times before. Bishop g2 and b5. Uh, I mentioned Carlsen had played this before, in fact, against Nidic earlier this year in the Grenka Chess Classic, Baden-Baden. Uh, Nidic played Castles in this position. Also, the move Knight BD7 has been seen, but B5 straight away. Uh, perhaps a bit more unusual, but still played. Um, and now White takes the opportunity to play Knight D5 to jump in with the Knight. And uh, black replies knight bd7. I think if you take with this knight like this, um, you have to be a bit careful that it doesn't run into uh, white gaining a lot of time, like so. Um, although matters are far from clear, of course. But Grishchuk instead decided to play knight bd7. White then rerouted the other knight to c3. He wants, I mean, a lot of this, when black plays e5, uh, if we just go back to that moment, uh, and knight d2, this square becomes 
the, the focal point of the whole position. And if White manages to get a knight there without contest, a lot of the time he's going to be a lot better. So that's why even before castling, we can see that Carlsen maneuvers his pieces around so that he can enhance his control over d5. Uh, Grishchuk, of course, has to challenge this square, so he plays bishop b7, and Carlsen plays a4. Uh, again, a very typical move, taking advantage of the fact that black can't play b4 because of knight takes. So, um, black has a decision. Grishchuk tried knight takes d5. b takes a4 had been seen before. Um, but after rook takes a4, castles, castles, knight c5, rook a1. Uh, this was seen in b either colon. Um, the problem is that black is always left with a, a weak isolated pawn, which can be a target. And white, on the other hand, is is a lot more compact and must be a bit better. So Grishtruk applied, tried knight takes d5, knight takes d5, and knight f6. So he's really committed to clarifying the situation on d5. Um, and here Carlsen um, showed that he is not really in the best of form, and he played the move a takes b5, which I think is probably a bit inaccurate. The move knight takes e7 was critical. Um, and uh, here, most players would, uh, without thinking, play the move queen takes e7. But after takes, 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 uh, takes, and here, for example, queen d3 attacking the pawn and defending e4, bishop c6, castles, castles, we reach a position which is, uh, as Alexander Grishchuk uh, very uh, very nicely put it, very sad for black. He's got a backward pawn on d6, white's got the two bishops, he's got an isolated pawn on b5. It wouldn't surprise me if white just put a bishop on this square to, uh, to make things even more awkward for black. He just said it was too sad. So actually after knight takes e7, I think his idea was to go king takes e7. Um, although even after this, after bishop g5, h6 takes, <laughs> and now king takes, which is really the only move. The king is slightly strangely played on f6, but there's no quick way to uh, to take advantage of it. I mean, you, you could try queen f3 check, king g6, queen f5 mate, but um, I think Grishchuk would have seen that and played king back to e7. And with the lack of a dark squared bishop actually trying to... Uh, simply checkmate this king is is not so easy. But a takes b5, the problem with this, with this is that it allowed the intermediate knight takes d5. Um, and I don't know if Carlsen missed this, but perhaps he had thought, well, maybe I can just take on a6, but actually there's just a, a simple pin here. So after knight f6, black's already better because takes, takes, just doesn't work for white. So white had to take back, but now after takes, takes, takes here, um, we reach a position where um, uh, this has really not worked out for white. Um, he's, he's been left with a pawn on d5 rather than a piece, and as a result, black's d6 pawn is no longer backward, and actually he has a very comfortable structure now. On top of that, he's aiming his pieces here, and he's got very fluid development. He's going to castle, um, perhaps even play with f5, or bring in the rook. It suddenly becomes a lot easier to play for black. Actually, we see this, because after queen e3, castles is an excellent move, and white castles. The problem is you can't take on b5, because after queen to a1, castles, and bishop a6, Whoops! You abs you you lose an exchange, and this is this is bad news. So White had to castle, and now another cute move: Bishop C8 by Grishchuk. He sees that um, the bishop can do a lot more along this diagonal, and also uh, the pawn is still immune because after takes Bishop A6, uh, you still manage to um, win the exchange. So Carlsen played bishop e3, and now bishop d7, rook c1, trying to activate the rook. From the white side, I suppose, as we'll see, the only real um, 
idea is to orchestrate a b3 and c4. We'll see how that works out. So rook c1, h6, ostensibly with the idea of, in some positions, going bishop g5, giving the king some lift. And now queen d1. Now, this is a, this is a very interesting move. I think it's a move that would occur to some grandmasters. Um, some would play it, some wouldn't. Jonathan Rousen tweeted during the game. Uh, he's a, if you don't know Jonathan Rousen, one of the uh, uh, the strongest, if not the strongest, Scottish grandmaster of all time. Got to to twenty five ninety nine. I don't think he quite broke twenty six hundred. But one of my favourite authors. You should definitely check out his work. Um, he said that it's this kind of move that makes the difference between the likes of Magnus and others. This move is a bit mysterious if you look at it. Um, why would you retreat the queen from its active post on d3? Well, the idea is simply to try and occupy the a-file. And there is certain logic behind that. The a-file is the only open file, so why not try and occupy it? So it's, it would be interesting to put a little survey uh, to some top players to see if they would have played this move. Um, but it is a very typical Carlson move. So he occupies the A file and black offers an exchange of rooks. And H4. This is another very typical Carlson-esque move where he performs a number of, uh, he achieves a number of things with one move. He stops any bishop g5 idea, but he also gives some love for his king on h2. So after h4, rook a6 was played and b3, and uh, black plays bishop d8. So notice how Carlson doesn't exchange the rooks, he maintains attention. But it's really around this point where things start to go a bit wrong for, uh, for Grishchuk, and Carlson starts to create some serious problems. c4, so the idea of b3 was to go c4, and after takes, takes. Now with the queen on b7, opening up this diagonal looks like a serious idea. Black played bishop b6, and white played c5 anyway. Um, this move is a fairly obvious move, but the follow-up, again, perhaps isn't. Because after the mass exchange, takes, takes, white has actually sacrificed a pawn, but his idea is that after d6 hitting the queen, he wants to occupy this square with a piece. Um, and actually after here, takes, takes, the move bishop d5 is an excellent move, and I think this was the move that Grishchuk missed. So White's idea is that he wants to play queen f3, attack the Achilles heel of black's position, and if the bishop ever comes back, you can distract uh, the bishop with d7, and you could end up winning quite quickly. And of course, the move queen takes d6, runs into bishop takes f7 check, winning the queen. So bishop d5, so black here had to play extremely accurately. It seems as though uh, bishop e8, was the most precise, but it's a very difficult move to make a backwards move, a passive move. Um, that said, it's not clear exactly how white continues here because, um, you know, queen f3 can now be met, my queen takes d6. So bishop e8 was a, which was a, was a decent try. Um, and any, any other move, queen b3 is met by queen takes d6. So things wouldn't have been clear here at all, and I think... Um, Black would have had very good chances to hold on. But the move queen c8 was a mistake by Grishchuk because now, after queen b3 hitting this pawn, bishop e8, the problem with bishop e6 is that you can take, you can't take with the queen because the pawn promotes, so you have to take with the pawn, and now the simple queen b6, and actually you're coming into c7, and this guy's running down. So you have to go bishop e8, and now the move queen c3 was excellent, hitting this pawn. And suddenly, white manages to win one more pawn. Black played c4 because there's actually just no other way of holding everything together. His idea was to come back to d7 and actually put white in a bit of a pin. But after queen b3 again, queen e8, queen f3, we see Carlsen. This is really where Carlsen is a class above the rest. He manages to turn the screw. And even a move like h5, this is a touch of real class. h5 here is a move that doesn't allow black to um, 
to free himself either with g5 ideas or constructing a favorable structure with g6 and h5. So h5, this clamping move, is a, a move that um, Carlson has got an innate feeling for. He, he understands how this will benefit him in certain endings, and we, we'll see this in a minute, how this, this mere pawn here can hold up the whole king side. Black went back, white uh, played queen e4, and white offered an exchange of bishops. The bishop came back. The problem is, of course, taking taking is miserable for black because the queen remains passive and white just needs to bring his king in. So you can't do that. Now white activates the king and black is pretty much in zugzwang here. He's got no useful moves. He would love to be able to free his position, but he simply can't. King h8, f4 is another good move. And Carlsen has foreseen that after e takes f4, which is what Grishuk played, uh, the bishop ending is completely losing. And it's once again thanks to having this pawn on h5. So after f4 uh, takes, well, black could have tried f5. And I think this was really the best chance because after queen takes e5, Queen takes h5, but this is a very, very difficult move to play, especially given that Grishuk would have been low on time or move 40, and the fact that you kind of win a flank pawn but allow white to centralize his pieces here. It looks absolutely gross, but I think the point is that after queen e7, black's got this absolutely phenomenal uh, resource to move king to h7. You basically use the bishop as a distract distraction tool because black has got, for example, queen takes d7, queen e2 check. And uh, this is a draw by perpetual. There's no way that uh, white could uh, could get out of the checks. You know, he's going to use the h5 square and this diagonal. And, and white simply cannot get out of the checks. And that would be a draw. So a difficult move and an understandable one that Grishuk played e takes f4. But now after takes, takes, takes on f7, that was perhaps a, a little shot that Grishchuk had, had missed. Beautiful little shot, the point being, of course, that takes d7 wins immediately. So Grishchuk gave a check, king f2, took on g3 and played bishop d7. Um, let's just take stock about you know what's going on in this ending. It's a curious one, because when I was looking at this from afar, I thought, oh, has uh, Grishchuk got some chances to hold here because um, his king is boxed in the corner. Um, and I thought, oh, there might be some stalemate tricks. You know, for example, uh, I'll try and set something up here for, for you guys. So bishop b5, king f4. I'm just making some moves here. Um, uh, you know, something like this. White brings his king in. Black says, okay. He gives up the bishop for the pawn. And I was wondering about something like this, but actually, um, this position isn't a draw. Because after something like this, 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 in this position here, uh, the way White wins it is he puts the king on f8, and after king h7, bishop b1 check, king h8. This is the position I had in my mind. But actually, I forgot white can just go bishop c2. And black does have a move. He can move the g-pawn. It's not stalemate. Um, curiously, I think if the g-pawn wasn't there, I think it is a simple... Well, of course, it's a simple draw. So after g5, now white can take en passant and deliver mate. Quite cute indeed. So basically, there's never a fortress in this position. So... Uh, no matter what happens, it looks as though white should win. Um, there was one more variation that white had to be a bit careful of, and that was the move, instead of bishop d7, the move g5 here. Because after takes king g7, white has to be very careful um, not to blow this. And in fact, the move that I'm pretty sure I would play, and, and a lot of grandmasters would play, and, and a very... Um, 
instinctively correct move is to move king to f4. You bring in your king along the dark squares, you want to avoid checks, and also you give yourself a coming towards this pawn and keeping an eye on this pawn. But actually king f4 is a mistake, because now after king f6, and let's say a move like king g4, there's no real other way for white to progress. The problem is he's got this very silly bishop now. But after king g4, black can now play bishop e4, and after king h5, he can give up the bishop and win the d-pawn. It's very cute, and that's a draw. So actually the correct move here is to go king g4, and the point is that now the king can come to h5, so if king f6, um, you've got king h5 in a lot of lines. King to g7, and maybe now just to move bishop to e6 with the idea of d7, and if check, I think you can block with bishop g4, and that should be winning because takes, takes, and the d-pawn runs. So instead, black could try bishop d7, king g4, something like this, but again, bishop e6 is the same story, where you're blocking the check. So a very interesting line that I believe Carlsen foresaw, but after bishop d7, actually, things were very easy. Just bishop g6, and uh, that was the end of the game. Grishchuk decided to call it a day, because black has got zero counterplay. You can't ever bring in the king. It's uh, completely cut out. It can get to f8, but no further. And white is simply going to bring in the king via whichever way he wants. Eventually he gets round to either e7 or c7, plays d7, and then we transpose into the line that we looked at before, where there is no fortress, there is no stalemate idea, because black has got this darn g pawn that can move up the board. So, Grishchuk resigned, and a much-needed win for Magnus Carlsen, who now sits on one and a half out of five, uh, still a very disappointing for him, still shedding about 15 elo points, but a win is a win, and today, uh, well rather in round six, he's got uh, one of his customers, um, even though he doesn't call it that, if Anish Giri had the kind of score he did, he'd probably call it that, that very way. Hikaru Nakamura, that is gonna be a, a very exciting game. Can Magnus continue his winning ways. Can Hikaru continue his very good form? Hikaru um, is is doing absolutely fine. I think he's on plus two and uh, he's uh, he's showing some very good defensive chess against Giri, against Anand. He's showing that he's holding slightly inferior positions. He's taking his chances. Will this be the turning point in their little rivalry? Uh, we'll see. Please remember to view all of the action from Chess24, everything will be live from four o'clock and uh, you can check out the commentaries of our very own Jan Gustafsson, accompanied with Dirk Jan from the studio in Norway. Don't miss out. But from me for now, I hope you've enjoyed this little edition of uh, Game of the Day and don't forget to check out the next one. It's been great having you. Cheers.